Good morning, everybody. Welcome to this uh, annual meeting of the Greater Manchester Combined Authority. Thank you to everybody who's joined us uh, online. Uh, item one, apologies, uh, no apologies received. Item two, uh, appointment of chair. GMCA members are required to know that Andy Burnham as the Greater Manchester Mayor uh, is the chair of the MCA for the next year. You can't call a vote, colleagues, unfortunately. As uh, much as you might may want to. Um, that's to note. Item three, appointment of vice chairs. Again, under the constitution, to note that uh, Councillor Sir Richard Lee's deputy mayor is automatically appointed uh, as vice chair, as is um, Councillor David uh, Greenhalgh, uh, also appointed vice chair. But colleagues, I need to ask for your agreement uh, to the appointment of Councillor Brenda Warrington uh, as vice chair. Uh, for uh, for the next year. Do I have your agreement? Agreed. Agreed. Thank you. Item four, Greater Manchester appointments and nominations 2020-21. I'll hand over to uh, Liz Treacy uh, to take us through the report and to update on any further nominations received. Liz. Thank you. Thanks, Chair. Um, yeah, so members are asked to note and agree the appointments and nominations as set out in the report that you've got in front of you. I don't propose to read through all of those nominations. Um, you have them and they're on the website. Um, there are some uh, small number of additions. If I could just um, go through those for Stockport, for the Culture and Social Impact Fund Committee, Councillor Kate Butler as member and Councillor Tom McGee as substitute. For the Health and Social Care Board for Oldham, Councillor Zahi Chohan as the member. For the Joint Commissioning Board, Councillor Zahi Chohan for Oldham and Councillor Jude Wells for Stockport with Councillor Elise Wilson as the substitute. And for the Greater Manchester Transport Committee from the districts um, for Oldham, Councillor Barbara Brownbridge as the substitute and Councillor Peter Robinson as the substitute for Hameside. Um, and then I'll hand back to the Mayor for the CA and Mayoral appointments to the Transport Committee and Transport for the North. Thank you. Thank you, Liz. Um, just to, to add then, colleagues, uh, uh, item 17 in this report is uh, to note the appointment of Alan Brett as, uh, as my substitute to attend meetings of the GM Transport Committee and also item 27 as substitute member of the Transport for the North Board and uh, also uh, item 18 to appoint uh, Sean Fielding as the GMCA member of the GM Transport Committee uh, and to appoint Andrew Weston as the substitute uh, member to that same uh, committee. I, I think that Liz that deals with all of the, um, the, yes. the proposals. Uh, Sir Richard Lees. Uh, just a couple of things on, on this. First of all, I think it's on the skills and employment executive. Uh, can we replace Councillor Bev Craig with Councillor Lutfer Rahman? And I see, is the Culture and Social Impact Fund Committee what used to be statutory functions once upon a time? No, statutory functions is the ACMA committee. OK, what does cult, what, so, right. Sorry, I've never heard of it. What does it do? <laughs> I don't have the terms of reference to hand. Oh, OK. Um, so I think I'll just get you the, I can find the other members. A second. Well, I, yeah, I, I, yeah, I'm not I'm not sure who I would uh, nominate to it without knowing what it does. So uh, if you can send well, it, it to basically me. basically looks at, sorry, can I come in there? Because yeah. I, yeah. Yeah, of course, David. David? Yeah, it, it is. Uh, oh, sorry, my camera's not on, is it? Sorry, apologies. Um, it, it is um, basically. Shall I wait for the uh, to go to get the on? The yes, I'm sorry, I'm just having some trouble. I can speak anyway, Andy. It's all right. Cause Please do, David. The camera uh, doesn't it, seem to be on, is, and I can't yeah. send you live. Uh, on that. I mean, I, all I was saying was it is basically what what it says on the tin. It looks into all the cultural um, aspects of uh, the conurbation and the impact it's having. It judges the outcomes within uh, our our funding. 
uh, we look at how we can reach out and, and uh, help cultural practices. So, so it is basically one based around the culture and the cultural offer. Okay, thanks for that, uh, David. In, in that case, our nominee for that will be Councillor Look for Rahman as well. Thanks, Richard. Liz, is that all you need? Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Andrew Weston. Thanks, Andy. It's just with regard to the substitute for Councillor Fielding on the Transport Committee. I think we had agreed on Tuesday that it would be Councillor Eamon O'Brien rather than myself. Uh, that's right, uh, Liz. Uh, I think we had the wrong um, the wrong recommendation there on on the report. Okay. That's fine. If, if you want to agree, Councillor O'Brien, that's fine if everyone agrees that. Yeah, that's my, my understanding as well. So thanks, thanks, Andrew. Julie, you're having trouble sending people live. Um, I'll do that. You're live now, Andy. OK. So thank you, colleagues. Any more uh, comments on the uh, appointments for 2020-21? If not, can I ask that all of those uh, recommendations are noted and agreed? agreed. Thank you. Agreed. Item five, schedule of meetings, 2020-21. Uh, uh, you can see it set out, uh, colleagues, in the, um, uh, in the note. Just to say, August to be confirmed. I think we're keeping that under review. We might uh, have to come to you to ask for a uh, an August date, but obviously we'll, we'll, we'll try not to if, if that can be uh, avoided. So uh, can I have your approval for the schedule? Agreed. Agreed. Thank you. Moving on to ordinary uh, business. Item six, uh, chairs, announcements and urgent business. There is just one uh, to, to uh, bring to the attention of uh, the combined authority. Obviously, uh, we remain in a, a, a very challenging uh, situation with regard uh, to the uh, ongoing pandemic. On the latest uh, figures uh, given, there have been um, a total of 2,814 deaths in all settings uh, in uh, Greater Manchester. And of course, each and every one of those uh, uh, people behind that, that headline statistic was someone's son or daughter, mum or dad, brother or sister. And of course, some uh, worked for the National Health Service and for uh, for the councils represented on this combined authority in, in social care. Uh, and there had been calls uh, for them to be uh, recognised um, for the, um, the service they provided. We have tried to respond to that and we want everyone to have uh, the chance to remember their loved ones personally and also recognise their lives. So uh, the uh, GMCA has been working with Manchester Cathedral uh, to see if we could um, make such uh, a uh, service uh, available. And I'm pleased to be able to update colleagues this morning that um, with the support of Manchester Cathedral, there will be an online um, memorial service on the 16th of July. And on that day, we will be launching a digital book of um, remembrance where members of the public will be able to send photos and um, thoughts uh, remembering loved ones with uh, special recognition uh, for those who've been serving our communities in the NHS and social care. We're grateful um, to volunteers from the uh, GM tech industry for supporting this uh, initiative. But colleagues, I thought you would want to know that and obviously that we would then appreciate your support in in publicising this initiative to all residents of Greater Manchester, as I'm sure a great many will want to uh, will want to um, to use this service. So just to say a thank you to the cathedral, uh, to 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 my own team and all of those in the tech industry that have worked to make this possible and uh, further details will be published in due course. Thank you, colleagues, uh, and let us move on to declarations of interest, which uh, you uh, know uh, how to um, complete uh, and if they could be completed uh, in the normal way. Item eight, uh, minutes of the meeting 
held on um, uh, Wednesday. Uh, this was the exceptional uh, meeting to consider um, the financial position of, of GM councils and public bodies. Can I ask for your approval of those minutes, colleagues? Great. Agreed. 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 Item nine, thank you very much. Item nine, uh, GMCA overview and scrutiny committees uh, that took place um, earlier uh, this uh, month. Three, housing planning and infrastructure, 11th of June, economy, business, growth and skills, 12th of June, corporate issues and reform, 16th of June. To note, thank you colleagues. Item 10, establishing women and girls, faith and race uh, equality panels. I'm going to introduce Councillor uh, Brenda Warrington to um, to present the paper uh, to you, but just a very brief word, if I may, um, about um, about this item. Obviously, since the arrival of devolution in Greater Manchester, we've been working hard to ensure that um, all voices in GM have their place in the, the debates and the discussions that we have. And colleagues will know we've established a youth combined authority, uh, which has really um, uh, found its voice an LGBT panel, uh, more recently a disabled uh, people's panel, uh, a GM ageing hub. But it's long been felt that we needed to keep um, this process going to ensure that there uh, was a voice on women and girls equality, the faith communities, but also a race um, equality uh, panel. And this paper sets out proposals to take forward uh, those, um, uh, th those uh, goals. <coughs> Greater Manchester has always stood for uh, equality and against discrimination of, of any kind. Uh, but we can't be complacent. I think it's fair to say that the situation we're living through has exposed the scale of the inequalities that still exist uh, within our uh, society. Um, and we, we know uh, that uh, communities, um, black community, the Asian community have been uh, amongst the hardest hit by um, by uh, the virus and we need to absolutely understand the reasons for that and resolve to uh, address these inequalities uh, as well of course in more recent times we've seen um, the, the whole concern around the gender pay gap uh, and the um, the unnecessary uh, harassment that uh, women and girls often face um, in uh, in, in work uh, and elsewhere and hence the need to go further on women and girls uh, equality. So these proposals come forward in that, that context and obviously particularly with the very topical debate about Black Lives Matter. We want to um, to not just respond with words um, to, to, the, um, to the current situation, we want to show action and I'm really pleased that Brenda has moved so quickly to bring these proposals to us today. So Brenda, uh, may I uh, hand over to you to uh, to introduce the paper? Of course, thank you, um, Mayor Burnham. Well, as, as the Mayor's already said, uh, we have been working for quite some time, long before COVID hit us, uh, in, in fact, to provide evidence uh, which would establish the need for us to set up uh, both a women and girls equality panel and indeed a race equality panel. Uh, and as you're all aware that the COVID pandemic has further exposed all of those inequalities uh, together with new inequalities uh, that, you know, still continue to exist in our society. And so it's felt that we now need to truly demonstrate our desire and our determination to tackle inequality in all of its appalling forms. We need to set up these two panels to add to the existing range of panels uh, that the mayor has already mentioned that deal with um, equality uh, again in our society. So firstly, on the women and girls equality panel, uh, this is evidence actually by work that's been undertaken for some time now by the Greater Manchester Women's Voice Task and Finish Group. And that group concluded that there is a need for the creation of a women and girls equality panel uh, to be an integral part of Greater Manchester's structures. The task group brought together partners to advise the work and I do know that previously I've raised this with leaders and we do have <coughs> support from all leaders um, on this particular point. 
And so we, we need to ensure uh, that this panel is truly representative of women and girls across the whole of Greater Manchester and of the varied range of communities, of sectors, of socioeconomic groups, uh, etc. And the report sets out proposals um, for recruitment to the panel, which we hope uh, with your agreement today we can undertake very, very quickly. And so the role and purpose of the panel, which is actually set out in the report, I won't go through it in detail, uh, but in section 2.3, it simply states that the purpose is to enable women and girls to live their best life in Greater Manchester. And it's as simple as that. It's powerful and it is a powerful ask. And, and that's what we're looking for today. And so to uh, formalise this panel, uh, today, we can actually start to get on with the job of recruiting members to this uh, vital panel uh, so that they can begin this very essential work for us. And then moving on, uh, if I may, to the race equality panel. So this this really uh, follows some representation uh, to um, Andy Burnham, um, our mayor, from a number of different community leaders uh, some time ago. And there was a co co cohesion summit that was held in July of last year, 12 months ago, in fact, now, isn't it? Uh, we held uh, from that, we held two engagement sessions, which were both extremely well attended by senior faith and race leaders from across uh, the whole of Greater Manchester, representing a huge diversity um, that exists across our conurbation. And the initial ask, was that a faith and race equality panel be established. However, we, we had quite some discussion on this point and it became very, very apparent to us quickly that the issues faced would be far too complex for a single panel to have any reasonable chance uh, of addressing. So what, what we've, we've done, we, we spent time discussing the pros and cons, but came to the conclusion that we should actually have uh, two panels, a race equality panel and a faith equality panel to tackle the complexity of issues that we know uh, exists. <clears throat> so we, we, we do actually feel at the moment there is a there is a real urgency to um, go ahead and set up the race equality panel. Uh, not least in view of public reactions following uh, the dreadful uh, situation in uh, America with uh, George Floyd uh, and his murder. Um, and we do plan actually to come back at a later date, although not too much later, with plans to set up a faith uh, equality panel. And proposals for the formation and recruitment of panel members for the race equality are actually set out in the report. Again, I, I won't go through those in detail, um, but the, the commitment to engage uh, with wide ranging uh, representat representation does exist. And it has become very apparent to us, uh, again, uh, possibly prompted by COVID as well, that BAME communities feel strongly that they are not being heard, they're not being listened to. And so what I want to do prior to actually setting up the panel is that we set up what I think we've termed as a listening event or a listening panel that would actually have the responsibility of helping us decide who should be the race equality panel members. And the listening panel uh, could be by appointment uh, and determined by both myself uh, and uh, Andy Burnham as, as mayor uh, so that we can get on with that as a matter of urgency. So obviously we need uh, agreement for us to be able to get on with that piece of work. And the, the key issues and aims, uh, again, that are very vital to this particular uh, work that's needed. Uh, again, as they set out in the report. So again, I don't propose uh, to spend uh, any amount of time in going through them. You can easily read them, but they will guide and advise uh, the work of the panel. We do believe that there's a real urgency uh, to cover uh, sorry, to convene the race and equality panel and also the, the uh, <clears throat> women and girls equality panel. It is essential because I believe that in addressing equalities, uh, this is quite frankly at the very core of one of our 
current very real ambitions to build back better in Greater Manchester. So we do need to be bold. We do need uh, to ask that we prioritise the whole equality agenda going forward. Uh, and obviously we need the buy-in and the support of every leader and every district in order to do that. So I am seeking endorsement of the two recommendations that are contained in the report today uh, to allow us to now formally begin this essential work and, and crack on with it. So thank you for that. Uh, I move that report, Chair. I do understand um, that uh, Deputy Mayor Bev Hughes may wish to comment on a policing aspect that would be very, very relevant to these two panels. Thank you. Thanks very much uh, indeed, uh, Brenda. Um, and as I say, thank you so much for working so uh, quickly to bring these proposals to us. And also thanks to Pam Smith, uh, Chief Executive Stockport, who's <laughs> also uh, supported um, Brenda in this. I think this is exactly the right thing to be doing and particularly the urgency around the race equality panel. You know, we've just received a report from Public Health England, which lays bare how um, different communities have been hit by the virus, particularly the Bangladeshi community, but other uh, main communities too. And we need to get on with the job of understanding why. Uh, and of course, then taking action uh, across all policy areas uh, to, to develop a proper response to that. So uh, I'll bring in uh, Deputy Mayor uh, 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 Bev, Baroness Bev Hughes. I don't know if Bev can hear me. If not, I will come uh, come back uh, to Bev. I will then ask the other Deputy Mayor, Sir Richard Lees, to uh, uh, to. Uh, to, to speak, uh, Richard. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks, Chair. I, I, I just want to speak particularly on the uh, race equality uh, platform to welcome the proposals and, and to uh, welcome the listening process that you're proposing to uh, to go through because it's certainly a very clear uh, message we've been receiving in Manchester, particularly from black communities, that they don't feel that they have a voice and that they don't feel uh, that they are being listened to. And I think it's in within that context I wanted to uh, uh, comment on the use of the term vain and I've even described occasionally uh, using the term of the vain community. Uh, the vain black Asian minority ethnic uh, communities actually the diversity of uh, this city region there are actually hundreds of them uh, there isn't a single community there is there are large numbers of very varied uh, communities and we, that diversity is part of the strength of the city region so uh, I think we need to be acknowledging and celebrating that vast diversity within the city region as well of course trying to build a cohesive uh, city region but I think it's important that we establish uh, a panel it's impossible to represent all of that diversity in one panel you, you just can't uh, can't do it but uh, it ought to, ought needs to be established on the basis that we do recognize uh, that <coughs> there's difference between communities and that we ensure that as far as possible all of those communities have a voice within greater manchester thanks uh can I can I just respond to uh, Richard? Yes, please, please do. Thank you. I, I think that, <clears throat> excuse me, that is an excellent point, Richard, uh, because as you say, uh, the, the the number of of diverse organisations, diverse communities, etc., 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 is actually immense. So to try and list them and make sure every single one. Uh, is represented is not going to be an easy task. But one of the, um, I think one of the first things that we will need to discuss is how we can uh, put together what would be an acceptable, an acceptable uh, representation of uh, all of those groups. And that is what we would need to discuss with uh, those uh, representatives, of course, in that listening event. So I think that is an absolutely excellent point and we will do everything we can uh, to address that appropriately. Thank you. 
Thanks. Thanks very much, Brenda. I just want to emphasise that as well. I think the listening exercise is a really important part of, of this rather than rushing to, to set up a panel without having fully consulted the community first. So, so Richard is right about that. And also I use the term, but it is a term I try not to use ironically. I mean, because for the reasons that, that were given, and I think we do need to ask people about language before in some ways anything uh, anything else um, so that we, we, we start um, in, in, in the right way. Um, and BAME is a phrase, a word uh, that I think we should um, uh, phase out and, uh, and, and ask communities how best uh, we, we, we should uh, represent uh, them all. Uh, Deputy Mayor, Baroness Beverly Hughes. Uh, your microphone's not on, Bev. Thanks, thanks, Andy. My apologies that I'm late joining the meeting today. It's something unavoidable happened this morning. Um, yeah, I just wanted really to agree strongly with, with Richard. I, I can never um, bring myself to use the word BAME. I do, I do use the term black and minority ethnic groups, but I think the principle that we ask people about language uh, and, and try and make that as inclusive as, as possible and reflecting what different communities uh, want us to say, I think is, is the best guidance. And that, of course, is what the listening exercise uh, will help us to do amongst um, other things. The work is going on to uh, establish that exercise, uh, that listening exercise, and, and that group will help us to develop the terms of reference. We'll move towards the appointment of an independent uh, chair with a you know, proper role description for that, uh, and then move to an open recruitment process uh, for, for the actual panel um, itself. I think around 15 people uh, probably is around the, the right number. But uh, as has been said, there will need to be kind of some some choices in that in terms of getting as as inclusive a panel uh, as possible. And just while we're on this, we are working, um, Andy, now within GMP on developing the wider uh, race uh, equality publication that the police have committed themselves to doing. I'm going to see a first draft of that uh, in July. We want to expand it beyond the usual statistics that we have always collected and put on the website uh, to try and give a more comprehensive um, picture and make sure that uh, some of the issues um, in the data that we've had so far, which are particularly around making sure that police officers ascribe ethnicity um, accurately uh, and always do so, so that the data is as robust as, as we can make it. And we're looking to have the first uh, public publication, if you like, of that wider data set uh, ready for September. OK, thanks very much indeed. Uh, uh, I can see uh, uh, David Greenhalgh indicating. So, uh, David. Uh, your mute's on, David. Apologies, sorry. Um, yes, it, it was just to make a point actually when, when we when we discussed this uh, before, I thought that was worth making in the public arena. Completely support the um, the setup of the panel. Hugely important piece of work. Uh, it was about the um, that I think has been alluded to about the, the disconnect that that uh, particularly probably not to appear to be general, but among the uh, particularly among the younger uh, cohorts of, of these communities that exist. And it's a plea to go out there when we look at this panel that we don't resort to uh, maybe if I can say previous practice. Uh, I think we should look to different role models and, and role models that they and this is all within the listening exercise, uh, different role models that they that you know that people from that community absolutely relate to. Part of the listening exercise is actually to get um, a proportion of this community to actually want to listen uh, and to engage. And I think the best way forward on that is finding and, and within uh, my portfolio, I put out a plea before, you know, there are considerable respected uh, black voices within the cultural portfolio. And I think if we can get a buy in from uh, those uh, representatives into this piece of work, we have a better chance of it succeeding rather than it becoming just as talking uh, us to each other again. And I think uh, if we can engage uh, with some of those uh, and, I, and I 
kind of hesitate from calling them community leaders, but they're, they're, they're leaders in their cultural fields to engage, whether they're in music or in art. Um, and, and I think if we can cut through that barrier and actually get those role models to, to speak out for those communities, we have a greater chance of getting that age of, a, that engagement and that connectivity with that cohort that we really need to understand how they're feeling at the moment. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, no, right. Thanks. Thanks, David. Um, Councillor Elise Wilson. Uh, th thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, yeah, I just really welcome this report and the work that's been done, and I really want to thank uh, Councillor Warrington for for this. Um, it is um, it particularly important, and I think what we've seen through this crisis is how it's affected certain people disproportionately. I think women and girls have been disproportionately affected. We know that um, uh, black people have been disproportionately affected, and we know that people from deprived areas have been disproportionately affected and so to be able to have these mechanisms and structures that actually raises the voice creates space for these particular uh, groups of people to be able to um, really make sure that we are adapting and we are creating the space at the highest levels and shaping what the city region um, should look like and make sure that everybody's taken with us is absolutely important. So I just want to put my thanks on record um, um, to this really, really important work that I know has been um, has been worked on actually for some time. I know I know uh, Councillor Warrington's been been hard at work at this for some time, but I think this crisis really puts it into shock focus so thank you thanks thanks very much uh, Elise um, and, and Brenda some some uh, warm support there for uh, for your proposals um, I, I think um, obviously though there's uh, interest in how we begin the conversation with uh, black and uh, Asian uh, minority ethnic communities as Councillor Greenhouse was saying, so I'm sure we can bring forward proposals as to how that is to be done to make sure it does get to the voices, David, that you were uh, that you, you were mentioning. Brenda, would you like to come back in? Yes, talk? just very, very briefly, if I may, uh, Andy. Uh, certainly welcome the um, the support from leaders, and certainly welcome uh, Elise. Uh, your kind words. You're right. We have been working on it for some time, uh, but nevertheless, it is important. And of course, I think we all accept that all of the different equality groups, none of them sit in isolation. They all somehow feed into each other and we do have to make sure, and I know that Pam Smith and myself do try to make sure that, you know, where one is impacted by something else, you know, that we make sure that all of the groups have, have the appropriate um, input and information. So there's a lot of cross-referencing that does go on and I think that is uh, as Elise says, very important. And uh, the disproportionate impacts, of course, Elise, absolutely. And I think that is what is, you know, one huge focus for us that we have to address and have to do our best to help resolve. And I think uh, all of the uh, aspects of needing to get the right people into these panels, uh, it will be a task. It will, it will not be easy because I think there will be uh, certainly a lot of people that will want to be involved but I do agree we have to try and get the right balance to get as far as possible the right cross-section in order to inform that panel in order to come to uh, you know uh, observations decisions conclusions that we will obviously bring to leaders ultimately so I do thank you for the comments and we have I have made notes of everything that has been said so you can rest assured it will be taken on board thank you Thanks. Thanks very much indeed, uh, Brenda. Um, so colleagues, uh, you have the, the paper and the recommendations set out. Um, uh, as you've just heard, Brenda committed to taking on board what, what colleagues have said. So can I ask uh, colleagues to agree the recommendations um, to um, uh, the establishment, the immediate establishment of women and girls and a race equality panel and the principles as set out? Agreed. Agreed. Thank you very much. Moving on, uh, colleagues, uh, to the next item, uh, which is a uh, one year uh, plan, uh, Greater Manchester plan for living with uh, COVID. Of course, um, there are different phases to this. Um, 
there's the the phase as the paper sets out, which is the release from lockdown, which of course we're we're, we're in now. Um, there's a second phase um, where we're going to have to live with the virus uh, until a vaccine or an effective treatment is found, and you know the the anticipation is that that could be uh, another 12 months, and then beyond uh, that, there is um, the whole question of how we recover from uh, the, uh, the the challenge we've been living through, the building back better phase, as uh, our LEP has um, has has uh, styled it. You know where we try and uh, build new foundations and rethink uh, how we do how we do things. So the paper sets out those three phases, and of course they're they're overlapping. And particularly this middle phase, living with COVID, um, it's going to require double running um, with response uh, to the virus continuing and all of the systems that have been set up uh, with regard to um, uh, test and trace. Um, but also in that same time, starting to lay the foundations for recovery. And that is what this uh, paper uh, seeks to do, to, to lay out the areas that we need to focus on in the next 12 months to ensure a, a safe recovery from COVID-19 in Greater Manchester. But more than that, a successful recovery where we take this moment to uh, to rethink um, how we do things and to to capture some of the the benefits that we've seen uh, in this uh, particular uh, time. So there is a list of, of, of uh, specific uh, actions set out in the list, which is uh, quite a long list, but nevertheless actually quite quite focused in some ways in terms of the, the proposals that um, are being suggested as part of a one year plan uh, just to, um, to to go through some of those. Um, the idea that we might further our ambitions on public service reform by keeping some of the community hub infrastructure that colleagues have been uh, have been developing, recognizing we need to support young people through this pro this uh, this this time, particularly with catch up uh, support uh, in in schools. We obviously have worked hard on uh, homelessness and giving everybody somewhere to go during lockdown. Uh, 2000 people have been supported in hotels and, and apartments. We've got to do everything we can to capture the benefits of that, help people make a permanent change in their in their lives and ensure that the gains are gains are maintained. There is more to be done around food resilience, um, the resilience of the uh, voluntary uh, community and social enterprise uh, sector. Uh, we've made a big leap into the uh, digital world uh, as part of uh, our response to the crisis, particularly with the development of, a, of an integrated care record uh, for uh, all of our residents um, and the development of uh, online services for mental health, uh, for instance. So again, how do we capture those uh, benefits? as we work towards a, a unified model of health and care. And we've talked about putting Greater Manchester forward as a pilot for a one system approach uh, to health and social care. And that uh, features, as you'll see in the list. Of course, we are going to need to support people uh, through this challenging time. Young people, as I've mentioned, but in this case, people 16 to 30 who will need support um, uh, if they are facing disruption to their plans for apprenticeships or training or in the labour market, helping people convert uh, their skills into growing areas of the GM economy in digital, in green construction. Recognising that many of the people that we have been uh, applauding in recent months, the essential workers who've been out there keeping Greater Manchester running, are also the people who often tend to be on the lowest wages and have the least uh, secure employment um, contracts. So taking forward our uh, ambitions for a Greater Manchester uh, Good Employment Charter to improve the quality of work for, for everybody in what we would call the foundational uh, economy. We've just been discussing inequalities with Brenda and we've, we've developed, we are already moving with our plans uh, there. Um, given that digital is so crucial now in terms of the delivery of services, we need to ensure that all GM citizens 
are able to be uh, participants in the uh, in the digital world and there is more more to be done there. We're about to receive a report from Councillor Andrew Weston on um, progress since the declaration of a climate emergency uh, and our five year five year plan. This could be an opportunity to accelerate uh, the pace towards 2038 for a zero carbon Greater Manchester and uh, a time to clean up the air, introduce a new model of mass transit and we need to uh, capture the, the, the moment and bring forward plans uh, to, to do that. As well, of course, as looking at the, 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 the funding challenge uh, that, that you all face and we discussed that uh, earlier this week, keeping confidence levels high in our towns, uh, in our cultural institutions um, and uh, developing a strategic framework for bringing in investment going forward. One, th colleagues, that's the list of, of things um, that uh, is set out in the paper. And of course, all of these things are about reducing inequalities and poverty in Greater Manchester, having safety at the heart of our recovery, uh, building a confident and resilient city region. I think public procurement uh, is something that uh, needs to play a, a more active role in achieving all of these objectives going forward. Uh, going, going forward. I had a discussion with, um, with, with Eamon Boylan about how we might look at um, GM public procurement in this context, particularly the link to the Greater Manchester Good Employment Charter. And it's my intention to bring back some first thoughts to you about um, uh, strengthening public procurement in Greater Manchester to achieve our objectives, but also in, uh, support our own supplier base uh, in the city region going forward to support our own economy. And we'll bring uh, proposals back to next month's meeting of the combined authority on that. So for today, colleagues, uh, just asking for your support for the uh, the, the, the broad uh, thrust of this paper, the, the, the priorities we're seeking to progress as part of this uh, one year uh, plan. Keen to hear any views that you, you might uh, that you might have. But I think this does identify um, the, the right, uh, the right priorities. And I think we've already got work ongoing in some of these areas. Now is the time, obviously, to, to accelerate it. To finish by saying we mustn't let COVID-19 lessen or, or slow the pace of our, uh, of our ambition with regard to a, a Greater Manchester where we don't have rough sleeping, where we have a cleaner air on track to meet a 2038 goal for zero carbon, uh, a place where we are reforming our public services to improve the service to the to the public. Um, these are the, the goals we've already set out uh, and this plan is asking you to to accelerate uh, progress towards those goals rather than, than downgrade our ambitions. So colleagues, uh, I will leave it there and uh, open up to um, anybody who wants to contribute uh, on this. Right, Andy, make a brief comment. Richard? Uh, right. very, a, a very brief uh, comment, really. It's um, Sorry if I, I seem to be heavily into language this morning, but it's the title of it, Living with COVID. Um, I know it's the title we've been using ever since we agreed the first draft of the recovery uh, recovery plan. But I have to say, as a title to enthuse people about the next one, <laughs> it doesn't quite work. Uh, for me. It's also actually um, the, the, the periods of time are always a little bit arbitrary and uh, there's a bit of optimism uh, in the report that within 12 months we'll have a mass vaccine. Well, maybe we will and maybe we, uh, uh, we, we, we won't. But uh, I, I just think this is as much about uh, how how we promote the work as anything else. So I think it, it would be good to uh, certainly see it as uh, a, a very important piece of uh, uh, the next phase of, of the work, but perhaps just something that uh, uh, I think if I have to live with COVID, I'm going to leave home, to be honest. So that's uh, uh, something that's just a little bit more uh, enthusing. I've no ideas, by the way, but I'm sure we've got people in the organisation that will think of something that's far more attractive. We, we, we do, but it's a it's a good point. It's hardly going to excite people, is it? The notion of uh, 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 of living with this, because yeah, I I, I take the point. This is about uh, kind of as I say, accelerating ambitions, and I think we need a 
a title for this plan that's going to uh, to reflect that. So thanks, uh, thanks, Richard. We will take that on, on board, and when we next bring it back to you, it will have a suitably more uh, uh, more, more exciting title. Andy, so colleagues, can I can I just yes, make a comment, Brenda. Brenda? Thank you. Uh, fully agree with with Richard. Actually, in terms of uh, it is important, you know, the terminology that we use going forward. But having said that, I, I do think that we're getting into a very dangerous phase at the moment, in my view, where the, the population, let's say, of, of the country at the moment uh, seems to believe that it's all over, you know, and, and we know that it is not all over. We know that that virus is very much out there still, very much active, very much still being transmitted, and we still need to be promoting those messages uh, that people have to be very aware of that and make sure that they observe all of the necessary guidelines to, you know, reduce, stop, cease that transmission so that this virus can be ultimately combated. Uh, as, as Richard says, we, we've no idea when a vaccine may in fact be available to us. So until we have that, I do think that we have to keep reminding people of the need for everyone to be responsible, not just for themselves, but for everyone else as well. Thank you. Brenda, I think that's such an important point um, because there is a sort of sense around, isn't there, with the, the announcement of the further measures that are coming uh, a week tomorrow that it, it is effectively all over and there's no need to worry and we are um, certainly not in that position at all yet and you are right to um, to, to remind us uh, about that uh, and it's very important therefore that the GM level we get that messaging uh, right and we get it uh, very very clear. Uh, so thank you Brenda, uh, point taken absolutely uh, on board. Any other uh, colleagues comment uh, comments, colleagues? If not, I, I hope you'll agree that this list does actually have some quite exciting proposals in it and um, would keep us in that leadership position where it comes to public service reform, public transport reform, um, environmental ambition, which we're about to com come on to. So I, I think this is um, shaping up to be a really powerful piece of work. If you're content colleagues, we will bring back to you specific deliverables in the areas that I've mentioned as part of the, the retitled uh, one year plan. So colleagues, if I could ask therefore for your uh, agreement uh, to um, the, uh, the proposal to bring forward a plan on this basis. Thank you very much. Of course, all of this work uh, will only uh, succeed if we keep a BDI on the Greater Manchester Economy. And with that in mind, I am going to introduce uh, our portfolio lead on the economy, um, who is going to, to speak now to a standing item on the, our agenda going forward, and that's the monthly economic dashboard, Elise. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, yes, um, so this, um, as previously uh, reported, uh, we are in the most of unknown of times and uh, the shock to the Great Manchester economy and a shock to the Great Manchester economy like we've not seen before. Um, now, in this uh, latest version, um, uh, I think it, I'd like to really draw your attention to the unemployment uh, claim count, which has increased over 90% across Greater Manchester. Um, and my worry around that is that um, it is really could be just the start of it. And um, we currently have over 326,000 Greater Manchester residents on furlough, and we're not quite sure as yet what's going to happen as uh, when furlough ends. Um, now, we are expecting some announcements from the uh, from government on their response over the next couple of weeks and um, we've been engaging with them both on the uh, large scale and involving into like partnership working and and how we can work with them and I'm really keen to um, learn our lessons from the response phase of uh, tackling this crisis and when we think about recovery um, we understand the ability of local government and and regions in delivering um, for the for, for the communities that they represent. Um, so I'm hopeful that um, that we will be um, 
tackling re recovery um, even better than we tackled the response. Um, that, that's what I'm hoping for. Now, we're not hanging around. We're not just waiting for government. Um, and I'm sure uh, the combined authority, you know, we are ambitious here, aren't we? So um, we will, um, we are, of course, doing work already. There is a, a comprehensive and wide ranging skills and employment response that's being developed and being led by Councillor Fielding. Um, and we've also been preparing investments through our Greater Manchester Infrastructure Programme uh, led by uh, Mayor Dennett um, and um, all of that is actually work that's taking place now by us, for us, not just um, waiting around to wait for government to come back with something. Um, we, I think it's also worth me put, uh, mentioning the business impact. Um, so as we've reported before, uh, surveys are being carried out by the growth company and the Chamber of Commerce, the Great Manchester Chamber of Commerce, and they're reporting very high numbers of businesses being impacted. I don't think that is a huge surprise to anybody. Um, the Chamber have received have released their quarterly survey this week, um, and that shows that the Greater Manchester Index falling to its lowest value ever in the second quarter of this year. Um, but it also shows um, some tentative signs of demand and business pick it, starting to pick up. Um, and um, their assessment is that the findings so far point to a steady but slow recovery. Um, which um, I think is welcome. Um, now, the Growth Hub have been doing an immense amount of work on this and really targeting sh and shifting um, so that they can really be uh, agile and responsive to what to what is going on. And lots of work is being done um, with business groups, with the combined authority, trade unions, because as you've said, Mr Mayor, that it, this is about making sure that we are safe to do so. The point that uh, Councillor Warrington made earlier is that, um, you know, the virus is still with with us and we want to um, recover, we want people to um, do well, but to do that we also need them to be healthy and well, um, so we need to do this safely. Um, so a lot of work is going into that and we are of course working closely with our local enterprise partnership um, who have been really supportive and um, providing their expertise and business leadership um, and considering the opportunities and the, and the challenges that we're facing as a city region. And I suppose um, it is it like that with that partnership working both as a combined authority with our business colleagues in at the Greater Manchester um, Local Enterprise Partnership and um, other business organisations, groups, trade unions and, and the government um, that we look to uh, build back better and really focus our work on, on that. Um, and that, um, as you've said, Mr Mayor, already we, we are considering work that uh, Councillor Weston's leading on, um, but that building a green economy and working towards our, our target of carbon neutrality by 2038, I think is particularly important. Um, and, and addressing um, the point you made of low pay and insecure work, um, and that has been so that's really stood out, hasn't it, in this crisis and 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 in our care sector uh, specifically, in our carers and, and thinking about actually how do we do that better? H how do we, you know, it's not enough just to clap. We need to make sure that um, these people that we rely on so much, you do such an important job um, that they are properly valued and that they can work safely. Um, and and we, if we're going to build back better, that is going to be a crucial part of it, Mr Mayor. And I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you very, very much, uh, Elise. Um, I think um, it's great that we've got this level of vigilance over, over the economy uh, and early warning of the issues that we're going to have to deal with and we are going to have to deal with uh, you know, a huge number of challenges over the coming time. So thank you so much for bringing this to us. I know that Deputy Mayor Bev wanted to come in before. I don't know if she, she wants to say what she was going to say on this item because it does relate to the, the last one in many ways. So, uh, Bev? Uh, no, Andy, it was the previous item and I'll just send a note in, thanks. It was it was on the one year plan and um, I, di I didn't realise your chat wasn't working, so I didn't get in. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry about that. No, it's okay. I Andy, if I can just comment, please. Please, please, Brenda. Yeah, can, can, I, can I thank uh, Elise for this report? It really is good to know that the, the whole Greater Manchester family, let's say, uh, is looking uh, to support each other because I think that is what is going to be vital going forward, isn't it? And, and I think the whole economy 
question is is something that we're all going to to have difficulties with uh, but i think if we know that we're all there to help each other out i think that is uh, what is going to be uh, hopefully a lifesaver for some of us because all of the areas that elise mentioned are areas that all of us i think will be grappling with so thank you for the report and uh, thanks for the work that's being done thanks brenda city mayor of salford all the best um thanks mayor burnham um like um, Councillor Warrington, I'd like to pay thanks to Councillor Wilson for this excellent report. Obviously, you know, we live in a fairly centralised democracy, shall we say. So decisions taken in central government and Whitehall will have profound implications for what happens within Greater Manchester. And I know Councillor Wilson drew attention to the work we're doing on infrastructure, but I think in terms of recovery, it's really important that government bring forward infrastructure programmes and investment as quick as possible to create those job opportunities as we move forward with COVID-19. I also think the issue of furlough is something that requires um, further attention in my opinion because we know that different sectors of the economy are disproportionately being impacted by COVID-19. And certainly I know in, in the city of Salford, sectors such as the creative industries, retail, food and beverage are being impacted significantly hard. These are also sectors where we have quite a reasonable amount of what I would refer to as, as low paid employment as well. And I just think it's really important that we try and lobby and influence the government around furlough because I am really concerned about the different sectoral impact furlough will have if the government nationally take a blanket approach to the lifting of furlough in the future. So I just wanted to flag that. I'm acutely aware of issues, for example, at the Lowry Theatre, you know, where they're having to look at an alternative to furlough to try and retain jobs ultimately in that really important institution. And we know in Greater Manchester it's, you know, a greatly performing institution in terms of contributions to GVA, but also in terms of social impact, creating opportunities for people, volunteering opportunities at the institution as well. But, you know, the Lowry is one of many within the creative industries that is going to be significantly impacted in Greater Manchester by the impact of whatever government does or doesn't decide with regards to furlough. So I guess I'm just making a plea there for a more sectoral approach to lobbying and influencing in this space. Obviously, we're waiting for the fiscal announcement or the fiscal statement next month and it'll be interesting to see what governments say about all of this but ultimately you know I think we need to be in the space of um, creating jobs and protecting as many people who, 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 who have employment at the moment within Greater Manchester and also supporting those who unfortunately have, have lost their jobs. I mean Councillor Wilson gave us an indication of universal credit claimants being increased by 90 percent and you know uh, over 300,000 people on furlough at the moment within Greater Manchester. That is a significant number of people. I'd also like to make the point about what's going on in the labour market. We know certainly over so the last 10, 20 years, we've seen a rise in in work poverty. And, you know, I, I'm acutely aware that the people we've been clapping for on Thursday evenings are the people who are being paid less than the real living wage. And, you know, I think we really need to seriously consider this moving forward. And I think there's a relationship between all of this and what we were talking about earlier in terms of tackling inequalities within society. Um, so I hope that the, the work that Councillor Warrington was talking about earlier is obviously related to all of this because inevitably everything's connected between the economy, the social and also the environment and you know inequality should sit at the heart of any COVID-19 recovery. But um, I just want to thank Councillor Wilson for the work we're doing here but, but there are some big challenges I feel at a national level that we'll need to continue to campaign and lobby on so thank you. Thanks. Thanks very much indeed, uh, Paul. Before I bring uh, uh, Elise back in to, to, to sum up, um, just to respond directly, uh, Paul, to your point about um, furlough and interventions in the labour market, together with the other eight uh, Metro mayors and the M9 group of which I'm a member, I met the Chancellor of the Exchequer uh, last week uh, and I just want to assure you and other members of the GMCA that I kind of put the points that you just made directly uh, to him uh, around furlough and young people 
reaching, let's say, a cliff edge at the end of furlough and actually some emerging evidence of abuse of furlough where uh, people are just being made redundant, sometimes without the necessary uh, processes being uh, followed. Uh, apprentices just seeing their kind of pr apprenticeship finish without the qualification being uh, provided. So you know, we, we're beginning to hear of these kind of issues and both ourselves, but also the, the M9 group more broadly has put in a request for a package of uh, labour market interventions that would be devolved to this level so that we can move quickly to support people through this uh, challenging uh, time, particularly people who've perhaps been on furlough and are now facing redundancy. Um, it would help, I think, if a mechanism could be found to pass uh, information of people in that position to to the, this level so that we could um, we could uh, uh, intervene. We're going to hear from Councillor Fielding shortly around um, uh, European Social Fund and, and, and money being provided to support some of our ambitions in this in this space. So we are we, we know what we're doing and we've got a track record uh, in supporting people uh, through things like the Working Well programme that we've been running. So you know, the, the, the call you're making, Paul, is the right one. I just want to assure you that the highest level of government uh, with other mayors, we have made a case for uh, a devolved um, capability to respond to what is going to be a year of great turbulence in the labour market. And we need to support people through it if we're to prevent the 2020s being like the 1980s in the, in the north of England. I'm going to bring Councillor Wilson uh, back in uh, uh, to respond uh, to the points she's heard. Elise? Yeah. And, Andy, I just indicated. I don't know oh, if you want my, to. Before. My apologies, then. Be before I bring Elise in, uh, David, yeah. let, me, let me hand the floor to, to you. Yeah, sorry. Over to you, David. Thanks, Mayor. I'll just wait for. Yeah, there we go. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, yeah, join in the congratulations to Councillor Wilson for the report. Hugely um, important report. Um, I, I just wanted to flag up one general issue uh, which I think we should be um, lobbying for. It's clear when we've spoken, of, when we've had this debate before and, and in the debate today, um, that it isn't a one size fits all for all these businesses. Some businesses are able to return and return and albeit considerable losses uh, and, and considerable amounts of money to make up, there are still, as, as, as Mayor Dennett said, and um, you know, those industries which are still facing huge challenges. And let's be honest, no, no light uh, at the end of a very long tunnel still appearing yet. And, and I think what's needed here, um, I, I can imagine centrally, it, it's very hard to, to actually determine these uh, which, you know, it, it's easy to determine the industries, but it's not really when you're not on the ground in these communities, it's very hard to understand the significant pressures, I think, um, uh, and, and how they all uh, fit into the overall um, delivery of economic recovery. So, so I'm really appealing for us to lobby for some discretionary funding, actually, which comes to us maybe in each of our individual councils. Uh, if that's via GM, that's absolutely fine. But I think we are best placed to know what sectors within our communities are struggling. And if we had discretionary help available to us, it's down to us then, it's our decision, uh, whether that be at GM level or within our local authorities. Uh, to actually help those businesses that we know firsthand are struggling, that we know give so much to our communities. I mean, I'll name the Octagon as one. We've just had a massive uh, refurbishment of the Octagon. They're already, every day that goes by, they are uh, racking up more and more debt because they can't open. And in, in a brand new building, which has just been completed, uh, massive uh, investment from the council uh, and from the Arts Council. Um, but I, I speak of all the cultural um, as, as, as Mayor Dennett uh, responded to, and the hospitality, because no matter what measures we bring in, and we've just introduced free parking in, in, in Bolton and all that, no matter what we bring in, if we, if we relax licensing laws, there are those pubs that don't have the ability to extend their car parks to outside. You know, there are just, you know, locational difficulties. You, some pubs would be helped by that, other pubs wouldn't. So you can't give a blanket proposal for the hospitality because some will cope, 
Others will not because of just their simple location. They haven't that facility to take advantage of space they may have. So I think discretionary funding here is the answer. And I just put a plea, I'd happily join in a campaign for that, whether that be at GM or local level, because I think we are best placed to make those decisions on those businesses uh, in our own communities. Thanks, uh, thanks very much, David. I'm going to bring Elise back in. I think we're all agreeing uh, with that and uh, looking to, to help us get that money out of the government, David. So uh, let's let's get cracking on that. But uh, Elise, I'll, I'll bring you back in. Yeah, uh, thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, and uh, thank you, everybody, for the comments. Um, I, I think that there's a couple of things, oh, probably more than a couple of things to pick up. One is, I think we're absolutely, there's, there's, there's a, for me, a horizontal and a vertical angle to what we're trying to do. We need to make sure that that we can deliver for where we are, for for our city region, for our boroughs, and for our communities and the people who live in our boroughs. And and as uh, because we're here, because this is this is us, and we are local government. We know that, uh, and we understand that. And I think. Um, it will be really, really important as we're building back better, as we're as we're going through recovery, that we um, that we do that, really understanding where we are. Um, and I suppose, I suppose if it were, this was a report, it would go place based working, wouldn't it? Um, so it's about really understanding where we are, making it relevant to that place. Um, and I think um, then, though, uh, it's also about um, the themes, the sectors. We know we have a lot of work with our local industrial strategy immense amount of work was put into that we have some clear themes that we need to uh that we want to drive areas of our economy that we want to see growth that we build that we believe the future will deliver um, those really um, well-paid jobs of the future for the people of Greater Manchester, and that working, and that means working with our local industrial, uh, local enterprise partnership, um, and making sure that we're taking those businesses with us and really understanding that. Um, but that hospitality, or uh, nighttime economy. Um, is is a real is a real area. We're one of the first to shop. Some elements of it will be some of the last to open, um, and and it'll be incredibly difficult for them. Um, the uh, I set up when I first took over this portfolio a nighttime economy task force, uh, working with um, really you know eminent people, people doing all kinds of businesses, running all kinds of businesses within that sector. Theatres, restaurants, nightclubs, uh, event organisers, um, pubs, bars, all, all, you know, a vast selection of people um, in there and, and really helping to make sure that, uh, as you say, uh, Councillor Greenhouse, making sure that we understand our local businesses and, 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 and really think about how we can best help them. Um, and I think part of that uh, is also the creative and cultural sector. Um, we have lots of artists, freelancers, uh, theatres, um, these are some of our most impacted sectors and, and we will really need to be mindful of what that, that looks like going forward and we're still waiting for obviously information around how what how and when that's what's going to happen with that and what the government's vision is around that as well as like gyms, nail bars, all kinds of others that are still we're still waiting to find out from. Um, I'd say um, the social care is a particularly important sector for very many reasons not least because we have been waiting and this isn't one particular government I can't say it's oh this is something for the last couple of years this has been something we've been waiting for for a long time but really addressing social care um, and 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 how that works and what people can expect um, and it really needs um, some proper thinking and some real reform um, and that's that's something that we really need the government and, and, and parliament to, to really start pushing on. But that, like I said, doesn't mean that we haven't got ideas here or the work isn't taking place right here locally and, and colleagues across uh, the combined authority, uh, are work, we're all leading and working in a joined up way because like, like was said earlier, it'll be about all of us doing our bit, all of us leading on those things and making sure that it is interconnected. Um, but I think that that work is there. I think Greater Manchester is a 
long track record of working together, of being joined up, of pushing past uh, the blockages to things, but making sure, but keeping our eye on actually what is the important thing we're trying to achieve at the end. And the important thing we're trying to achieve at the end is is the best for the people of Greater Manchester at the end of the day. So um, with that, uh, Mr Mayor, I will uh, leave it there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Elise. Really good discussion. And um, it's great, actually, we're beginning to get very focused, aren't we, about um, the economic challenge that lies ahead. So uh, thank you, Elise, for your work in um, uh, bringing that, that, that focus to our discussion. So colleagues, uh, this is obviously to note uh, uh, the, the dashboard. And as I say, we'll, we'll bring it back to you on a, on a monthly basis so we can uh, have that um, oversight and early warning of what's happening in the GM economy. So a really good, a good development. Let's move on to item 13, uh, bus reform uh, consultation update. I will hand over to our Chief Executive Officer, Eamon Boylan, to introduce the report. Eamon. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, what you have is um, a mercifully brief summary report backed up by voluminous appendices uh, that give you the full um, detail of the consultation exercise carried out with uh, the public and stakeholders on the proposal um, uh, for, to, uh, for bus reform. Um, as the report sets out, there was overwhelming support from the public uh, for the proposals to, to move forward uh, with, with, with reform. Clearly, um, the market assessment that underpinned the consultation was carried out in pre-COVID period, and therefore there is a need for us to work through issues uh, so we can effectively reflect the changed market conditions that we're working in as a result of the huge up disruption through all public transport networks, uh, including bus, uh, as, as a result of, of COVID. So the uh, recommendation is for the reports to, uh, to be noted and that uh, uh, members will receive a further report which we're planning for the autumn uh, on the, uh, the impact of COVID-19 on the bus market and recommendations about appropriate next steps. Thanks very much uh, indeed, Eamon. So uh, this is obviously to, um, to, to note uh, at, at this uh, at stage and of course um, uh, to, um, to, to await uh, further developments as we um, uh, consider the impact on the market, as, as Eamon has uh, said. So colleagues, uh, if I could just ask uh, for your uh, agreement to proceed on that basis, noting the report. Thank, thank you, everyone. Um, item 14, um, GMCA Climate Emergency Declaration Update and Five-Year uh, Environment Plan. Going to invite uh, Councillor Andrew Weston to uh, to introduce this. Already been mentioning how pleased I am with the progress that we're uh, that we're making since we declared that climate emergency. I think we've really uh, uh, got much clearer about what we need uh, to do. And as I say, I think this this moment that we're living through is an opportunity to accelerate our green ambitions. Thinking back to the last item, I, I see huge potential in the green economy, particularly green uh, construction. Uh, and it's time for us to um, really step into that uh, space and uh, uh, and make progress on our ambitions, particularly around retrofitting properties, um, building a new generation of zero carbon housing. Um, you know, these these are opportunities that now lie before us. So, you know, our green ambitions are, are in no way in conflict conflict with our economic ambitions. They are one and the same thing. Uh, and with that in mind, I'm going to uh, invite. Uh, Councillor Weston to uh, introduce the, um, the the paper to you. Andrew. Thanks Andy. So colleagues will recall that following the publication of our five-year environment plan we declared an uh, climate emergency within the CA last July. So this paper outlines the actions subsequently agreed to deliver on the declaration um, a number of a number of issues. So, um, including establishing new governance arrangements under the Green City Region Partnership and Board, mm -hmm. identifying opportunities to further reduce carbon emissions from the GMCA's operations for um, things such as retrofit and EV charging, putting climate impact assessments into our decision making processes. Um, assessing the potential within our public estate for reducing emissions across the 10 districts and then Andy 
on the point that you made on the one year plan paper around public procurement. That's something that we're currently looking at from a green perspective as well. And we'll be bringing forward a revised sustainability strategy for the CA um, covering that in the next six months or so. Um, also included in the paper is our annual report, which sets out the progress against the five year environment plan, which considering everything that has been going on, has been very positive. Thanks um, in no small part to our fantastic partners who have stepped up to engage with us and work uh, to create a greener future for the city region. So cross sectoral challenge groups have been established to help us decarbonize homes and buildings to help generate more local renewable energy to improve recycling um, and the sustainable use of resources and also to develop and this is critical really the tools to communicate all of these to our citizens and businesses because we really do need to take them with us um, obviously covid has brought its challenges but over the last few months that engagement's continued online whilst policy and program development work has been able to progress unabated. Some of our delivery in helping to install solar panels um, and to insulate residents homes as needed to pause just because of social distancing rules. But that said, it's worth considering the positive environmental benefits that have risen as an indirect consequence of COVID as well, which have been um, fairly well documented. But obviously the current pandemic has seen carbon and NOx emissions fall significantly as a result of reduced private car and public transport usage, plus decreases in electricity and gas use in commercial and some domestic buildings as well. Actually, um, citizens awareness of improved air quality and the value of their open spaces in particular has also increased, which is positive. Um, and actually, if the current level of emissions were to be maintained for the remainder of the year, Greater Manchester would for the first time be on track to meet our climate change commitments of carbon neutral by 2038, which I think is illustrative um, in and of itself. But it's worth noting just alongside that um, and by way of wider context that yesterday the Committee on Climate Change produced its annual progress report to Parliament. A um, number of relevant findings in there that, that tell me really that we're, we're broadly in step with the national debate, albeit more ambitious because our target is 2038 versus a national one of 2030. So they were saying things like obviously um, COVID has impacted on the transition towards net zero emissions, not unsurprisingly. Um, in 2020 globally, emissions are expected to fall by between 5 and 10 percent, but that we could have a potentially larger fall here in the UK. But again, obviously, with the with the caveat that that would only ever be temporary. Climate positive behaviours have increased during lockdown, so increased remote working, cycling and walking becoming the new norm. And, and we need to obviously have a strategy for how we um, can continue that. And then obviously um, a clear view from them that the case has been made for um, economic, social and environmental benefits from expanding schemes such as investing in low carbon and climate resilient infrastructure, from reskilling, retraining and research for a net zero climate resilient economy, for upgrading our homes and other buildings, making it easier for people to walk and cycle, as I've just said, and also for positive um, environmental infrastructure steps around tree planting, um, peatland restoration, green spaces and other, and other green infrastructure. So a bit of an overview there, both in terms of where we're at with the five year plan um, and against the declaration of the climate emergency last year, some of the work that we'll be doing in the months ahead, but also where that places us in terms of the national context, which is that we are broadly on the same um, lines, but as is always the case with Greater Manchester, far more ambitious than um, the national policy more widely. Um, so the report's just for noting and by way of update. Thanks, Andy. Thank, thanks very much to you, actually, Andrew, for your leadership uh, on this. It was your idea to um, declare a climate emergency in Greater Manchester, and I'm, I'm glad you did uh, put that forward because obviously all the work we have been doing uh, pre-COVID is now hopefully going to uh, bear dividends uh, for Greater Manchester. Um, we've obviously been developing our thinking through the, the two green summits that we've held and just want to confirm we're going to hold another one later this year um, as an online event 
uh, but all of this is, is keeping the, um, the the momentum building and fantastic to hear that you know we could hit that 2038 target as you as you say so really encouraging uh, progress colleagues would anybody like to come in on the back of what Andrew said uh, I'd like to please Andy please Brenda, Brenda. thank you very much uh, first of all, to, to thank Andy, to thank Councillor Weston for again an excellent report on, you know, what is a very, very important topic for all of us and uh, for our future. And I think it's a real ironic consequence of COVID that we we saw a noticeable improvement of air quality, didn't we, um, over that uh, 10 to 12 weeks. But my fear, uh, and I wonder whether um, and Andy has been able to consider this as yet, is that as uh, the government uh, now are seeming to be quite bullish in re relaxing the lockdown uh, uh, situation, that frankly, because it's, it's happening so quickly <clears throat> and without proper thought in my view, uh, I do honestly think that if we're not careful, we're going to end up back at the, the same levels of pollution um, that, that we, you know, we had prior to the um, lockdown situation. Because, you know, we, we said that, you know, whilst COVID in itself is, is horrendous, there are some learnings that we can take from it. And I think one of them is, you know, without any shadow of a doubt, lockdown and the fact that people were not using um, vehicles etc cetera, etc cetera. the businesses weren't running and and you know all of us adding to that pollution you know it's shown us how quickly uh, the, the the air quality can start to recover but likewise how quickly that air quality can actually go back into a a situation you know where it is disastrous uh, i know um, we in tameside um, al along with Greater Manchester, we declared a climate emergency in February of this year uh, b before this pandemic hit. And, um, you know, we, we are committed to doing what we can, you know, to get to that uh, 2038 level. But as I say, I, I do fear that if we don't seriously implement some of the uh, things, you know, like the walking and cycling initiatives, etc., that um, you know we've been planning for for a while, then we are going to lose that window of opportunity uh, very quickly if, if we're not careful. So I, I just wonder whether that's a factor that uh, Councillor Weston has uh, considered. I'm sure it is. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Brenda. I don't know if Andrew wants to come back in on that. Yeah. Yeah, I think. Basically, Brenda, it's something that isn't entirely in our control, but we're seeking to influence it where we can. And that's um, obviously with the, te the temporary measures that are around the walking and cycling funding that are going in, but also the, um, the longer standing work around the clean air plan, um, but also the changes set out in the transport strategy 2040, which will obviously assist with this. Um, I will be very excited when things get fully back to normal and usage on the new Metrolink line out to the Trafford Centre um, start to show the difference, particularly for people who work in Trafford Park, um, which is a very heavily polluted part of the, the conurbation for obvious reasons. So, so I think I think we were moving in the right direction in the first place. I think we've shown um, well, we've seen not not through circumstances within our control. Um, just what a difference can be made from changing public behaviour. It will be more gradual for us, um, just just by the nature of what we're what we're dealing with and and the fact that we do need to sequence this. But certainly, um, you know, all of our plans are that we will have achieved um, compliance, certainly in terms of um, NOx emissions by 2024 um, and potentially sooner. There's other exciting work going on, um, as you say, around the walking and cycling stuff, and also I know Manchester are. Um, investigating the possibility um, of further work that would help improve air quality within the city centre. So, so there are a range of factors. It's difficult to say um, that we'll be able to stop any return to normal. And, and clearly, um, I have some concerns about the point at which we're lifting lockdown. But, but certainly, I think it's it's always been our long-term ambition. And unfortunately, we've got some 
um, some considerable measures in place or coming on stream in the next couple of years that will help us, if not maintain that in the short term, certainly get to a much better place over the next few years. Thanks, uh, thanks uh, very much, Andrew. And again, thanks for everything that you've done to put us in this position. Um, Brenda, you are raising an important point. Um, there is a risk of certainly increased road congestion uh, in the um, in the short term in this living with uh, COVID phase, if I might use that uh, that title again. Um, but as Andrew said, the um, the clean air zone. Um, and uh, efforts to accelerate cycling and walking, which we're coming on to discuss, you know, hopefully will mitigate against those those risks. But you're right to uh, to, to raise concerns uh, about them. So, colleagues, um, uh, this obviously is just an update. We're just asking you to, to note the report. It's been a uh, a, a good um, a good update from Andrew. Are you happy with the report? And to note, um, the councillor Greenhouse wanted to make a point. Oh. Sorry, David. Uh, no, I didn't. That was the last. Uh, that was the last item that I that I asked for. That. Yeah, thought so. Thanks, everybody. So, if that report is duly noted, um, if we could move on to item fifteen, European Social Fund, twenty fourteen to twenty twenty. This is a program uh, update. Um, as I say, very much connected to the issues we were discussing before about the labour market. So I will ask uh, uh, Sean to introduce uh, this item, Councillor Sean Fielding. Thanks, Chair. Uh, so this report provides an update on Greater Manchester's European Social Fund allocation within the European Social and Investment Funds programme 14 to 20 and how delivery activity has been shaped where possible to respond to COVID-19. The ESF programme supports activities which increase labour market participation, improve youth employment for hard to reach groups, promote social inclusion and develop the skills of the potential and existing workforce. And the Greater Manchester Local Enterprise Partnership received an ESF allocation of £162.8 million to support a minimum of 137,000 GM residents. Arrangements put in place included Greater Manchester securing its own ESF co-financing status in 2016, which initially supported the Working Well programme. This, this has provided us with the ability to move away from nationally commissioned programmes and procure and manage provision based on local evidence of need and demand. The current ESF commitments are set out in tables under Section 2.2 and a profile to support over 181,000 individuals, which, if they're delivered, will exceed ESF outcome targets and progression into employment, education, training and achievement of skills qualifications. As acknowledged under Section 3, COVID-19 will impact delivery of ESF programmes for an unknown period of time. We've agreed some very practical measures to reduce disruption as much as possible, such as e-signatures and amending contractual models as much as we can. Section four of the report sets out the performance of our ESF programmes and the potential impacts of COVID-19. And some highlights include Working Well, which has supported more than 3,000 people into employment, exceeding its original targets. The approval of the £45 million GM Skills for Growth programme, the submission of an £11.85 million co-financing application to reduce needs in Greater Manchester and support up to 6,000 of Greater Manchester's most disadvantaged young people. And this will also be match funded by the adult education budget. The recommendations are set out at the front of the report and I hope that they'll receive the support of the combined authority today. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, uh, uh, Sean. And um, the experience of running this over the last six years and all of the, 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 the uh, schemes identified in the report are, are what I was alluding to before and said we've built up a track record of knowing how to intervene in the labour market and, um, and therefore bring about success. It puts us in a strong position, Sean, with regard to the bids we're making uh, for further devolved funding to, to uh, develop uh, local skills systems. I've got uh, Councillor Eamon O'Brien who wants to come in this item, so uh, Eamon. Thanks Andy, thanks, Andy. And, uh, thanks Sean for this report. Um, I just wanted to ask a, a quick question about um, 
the way we engage with our, our business uh, businesses, business leaders, sort of industry experts in Greater Manchester. Um, off the back of some of the work we've been doing uh, during COVID, we, we've seen a lot of businesses come together with the local authority and, and be a lot more collaborative, uh, be a lot more engaged in not just passing through information, but actually um, coming up with and assisting with the solutions to some of the issues we've all been facing. Uh, and I know from, from my experience in Berry uh, and with groups like uh, Made in Berry, you know, they run things like a business academy where they actually train up local businesses. And I'm sure we've got lots of other examples of that across Greater Manchester. Uh, and it was just looking through the particular aspect in this report about um, skills and, and financing some of our, our skills uh, engagements and training. And really just whether there was an opportunity uh, coming out of this um, to not just have um, an employer led input, which is really great to see in what we've already got, but some more flexibility maybe about um, using our employers and uh, industry experts uh, as part of the solution, uh, not just traditionally through the um, sort of existing providers, which, you know, some of whom don't always buy into the sort of wider social and economic uh, mission that we all have, um, but but sometimes act a bit sort of functional. Um, so it was really just uh, about as we sort of move into the recovery from COVID, uh, whether or not there's sort of that little space and that opportunity has opened up of, of engaging more with uh, business leaders and industry experts as part of a solution uh, and not just sort of uh, part of the sort of information gathering and input. Thanks. Thanks, Owen. It's a really good point, uh, Sean. Yep. Uh, yes, uh, thanks, Chair, and, and thanks, Eamon, for that question. Uh, it is it is more essential than ever that we engage employers really meaningfully now uh, following COVID-19. We need to be listening to what they're saying. We need to be listening to the intelligence that they are providing on furloughed sectors, on, on sectors that are not going to be able to return to, to normality the way that we would have known it prior to the crisis. And um, even prior to COVID-19, I think uh, it's fair to say that we did have a, a really strong track record of engaging with employers and bringing them together with training providers too, uh, not least through the Employment and Skills Advisory Panel, which I chair and which has been meeting um, more regularly uh, during the crisis. Uh, it was previously a meeting that only took place quarterly, but uh, we're currently moving, we've moved to fortnightly meetings and the last one was only yesterday morning where there was a huge amount of data and a huge amount of information shown to the panel uh, around uh, how furlough was affecting the economy in Greater Manchester, the differential impacts on different sectors, which I know that uh, other members on this call have spoken about this morning, uh, and how we can really uh, work together and make sure that we're all on the same page in adapting and providing for where the gaps are. Um, and I think that having that kind of dialogue with our businesses is really, really useful. And, and you can almost see the kind of moment of realisation sometimes but where people are seeing, oh, actually, if we work with the guy sat opposite us on this around this table, uh, we can do something that's much more effective than if we uh, work in our separate silos in the way that other places around the country. Uh, that's probably typically how it how it happens. Uh, in terms of some real specifics in the report, there are some details around the skills for skills for growth program under section four. So whilst it's not limited to skills for growth, and it's it's a big part of how we work uh, in Greater Manchester, engaging employers. Um, but under skills for growth, you'll note that 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 is an employer led approach to understanding what the skills needs are. Um, it also makes reference to the, the GM Good Employment Charter as well, which is something that has opened up a dialogue with huge numbers of businesses and organisations and employers that otherwise we might not have had a stronger dialogue with. And that's because they want to buy into the idea of, of being a good employer in Greater Manchester and getting recognition of doing that as well. So in, in response to your question, Councillor O'Brien, I think that we have some really strong relationships that pre-existed the COVID-19 crisis with our business community, uh, but we are making every effort to develop those even further and make sure that our learning providers in Greater Manchester uh, totally understand what our ambitions are as a city region and also what the needs of employers are so that we can give people the right skills to move forward and recover as quickly as possible after we exit this crisis. Thanks. Thanks very much indeed, uh, Sean. 
And it's a bit of a theme, isn't it, developing this morning, colleagues, that you know the plans we've laid over the last three years are, are now really coming to the fore and coming into their own. Uh, and this is another example in the same space. And uh, just to add to Sean's answer, Eamon, we've, we've developed a system called GMAX, Greater Manchester Apprenticeships and Career Service. You know, it's meant to be a, an alternative doorway for young people as opposed to UCAS for un the university route. This is intended to give clarity about work related opportunity, apprenticeships, et cetera, in GM. And, and that actually is an, an opportunity for business to drive the skills system because obviously it's their their opportunities that and the qualifications they're looking for that, that therefore education providers then need to respond to as opposed to just responding to the uh, the, the diktats from uh, from the DFE. So uh, you know we've got an infrastructure that's been built here and now's the time to really make it work and get employers fully engaged in that and get, engage, get employees in driving this education system. So, Sean, thank you. Uh, in the same way, I thanked Andrew. Thank you to you for all of your leadership on this. You've moved really quickly uh, to, um, uh, to to give stability to the, uh, particularly to the providers through this um, through this crisis. Uh, and uh, the proposals you put forward today uh, make make great sense. So, colleagues, can I um, uh, ask that uh, the proposals, as outlined by Sean, uh, be uh, be agreed. Um, just bringing them back. So I've got them in front of this is just noting uh, progress, approving that GMCA can now proceed with its GM skills for growth program and delegate authority uh, as appropriate. Uh, delegate authority um, to proceed with the procurement and the contracting of providers. Um, so colleagues, can I ask for your support for that? Yeah. Sounds just about like we got it. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, thanks very much indeed, everyone. Uh, thank you, Sean. Moving on to item 16, uh, colleagues, I don't intend to detain you long because I, I hopefully don't uh, have bad news for you. In fact, I hopefully have the opposite. This is a, uh, a an update from the Mayor's Cycling and Walking Challenge Fund, uh, noting progress, but in particular, uh, approving the release of, of funding um, for the development costs of nine uh, schemes and uh, separately approving uh, 3.25 million for the um, Manchester City Council scheme at Princess Road Mancunian Way uh, and this will enable um, full approval and the signing of a delivery uh, agreement. You, you know all about colleagues the, uh, uh, the, the, the ambition for the B network and the funding we put behind it from the Transforming Cities Fund. Uh, obviously want to Pay tribute again to our cycling and walking uh, commissioner Chris Boardman uh, and all of his team, Nick, uh, Richard Nixon, uh, and others who are working hard now to accelerate our ambitions in this uh, uh, in this area. Let me but quickly take you through the schemes that we're proposing for uh, development um, cost support. Um, Bolton Town Centre uh, Phase One, three hundred and seventy-five thousand pounds, a GM bike hire scheme which has been a long held ambition and we are now moving towards a procurement, hopefully with a scheme on the ground at next year. Uh, a GMB network crossings scheme, uh, particularly to support uh, pedestrianisation across uh, the city region, incredibly important. Salford Chapel Street, Trinity Way Junction improvement, developing a Cyclops type design. That sounds, uh, sounds complicated, uh, but uh, interesting. Salford Gore Street, um, Salford Chapel Street East Phase 2, uh, Tameside at Denton to Hyde and I've got to uh, advise you all of a, an amendment to the scheme. The paper says £167,000 uh, development cost. It's actually £358,160. I'm not sure the leader of Tameside is going to object uh, to, to that. Um, uh, but of course that has a consequential amendment uh, change to the recommendations so it's actually up to seven million pounds colleagues that we're asking you to approve uh, today going down the list wigan lee atherton tildesley uh, which is a big scheme uh, somewhere i know well uh, 1.7 million pounds uh, asked there uh, i'm sure councillor molyneux will will uh, even as treasurer support this uh, this uh, and uh, wigan standish to ashton uh, 1.9 million uh, again I'm sure that will have his support. So these nine schemes together um, represent an ask of around, well, now up to seven million pounds 
uh, from the fund um, and their approval would result in a total of 45 schemes having received development cost approval. So an acceleration of our of our progress. A word on the, uh, the Manchester City Council uh, scheme and I'll bring uh, Sir Richard in in, in a moment. Um, this has had program entry be before uh, and now this is about full approval as I say. This scheme, colleagues will know exactly the, 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 the junction, this scheme will greatly enhance the cycling and walking facilities at what is one of the busiest uh, road junctions uh, in uh, Greater Manchester, part of the Manchester Salford Inner Ring Road. Um, it's a significant uh, cause of severance for pedestrians and cyclists presenting real difficulties for people getting uh, over and it would address this through an intro introduction of fully segregated high quality uh, crossing points uh, over over the junction. So um, it's been through all the necessary um, uh, procedures. Um, we could move very quickly on this scheme if, if colleagues agree to final funding uh, approval today overall. Uh, I think it's a £9.2 million pound, uh, scheme. Uh, Richard. Uh, thanks, uh, Chair. I, I certainly hope the uh, CA will approve the uh, scheme because that uh, junction was absolutely for pedestrians uh, unpleasant. Uh, it's a really nasty series of underpasses. Uh, as an alternative to crossing the road and for uh, for cyclists it's probably one of the most dangerous junctions anywhere in, in in greater manchester so doing something about that's really important but what i wanted to come in on was uh, something else and it's really to, it's to ask a, a question which i suspect we won't know the answer to within uh, the meeting uh, i had a meeting yesterday um with i, th I think 33 uh, Labour councillors in Manchester talking about uh, active travel. Uh, the issue that they raised most was walking and facilities for uh, uh, pedestrians. So the very strong theme around that and clearly the Manchester scheme benefits both uh, uh, cyclists and pedestrians and if we can create win-wins win that's the ideal place to be. Uh, but subsequent to that I had a, a, an email from one of the members, which uh, I guess asks a question I don't know the answer to, uh, but I'll, I'll read just an extract from it. Uh, so it's from uh, one of my Labour councillors. Uh, I recently had a quick look at the active travel schemes Greater Manchester is funding and was struck by how much money was being spent on schemes which only benefit cyclists as opposed to ones which were aimed at making walking uh, easier. Now, uh, I'd say if, if it's the case, then Manchester itself will be to a certain extent guilty because the Chawton Cycleway alone is is predominantly a cycle scheme and, and does not give uh, vast amounts of benefit to pedestrians. And indeed, there have been complaints from uh, some disabled groups that in fact it might make some of it might make conditions worse, particularly for people for hearing and visually. Uh, in, impaired, but I think it, it, I, I have a concern because nobody lobbies for pedestrians that uh, uh, that we don't give them enough attention. I think it would be worth at least doing an, a, a proper analysis of uh, of what we have spent so far, and really just to see what the balance balance is between uh, walking and cycling within the overall fund. So I I, I can't res respond to the member because I I can't say whether. What you're saying is true or not and I, I simply don't know but it will be useful to know wouldn't it so that uh, it might as we get to, uh, for later stages of the fund inform the judgments we want to make uh, thanks sir uh, thanks thanks very much uh, richard and it is uh, a very fair point i mean obviously when we appointed chris it was as cycling and walking uh, commissioner and uh, i know he's uh, passionate uh, about about both and it is about prioritizing both um Oxford Road is the is the, the gold standard, isn't it? Because it tries to create um, safe space for everybody. And for me, that's what we really should be trying to do as much as we can, you know, where everyone has got a road or pavement space where they, they can use it without without risk of being um, uh, knocked down by 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 other other road users. So I think the, um, the the challenge is one I'll take back to um, to the team and ask them to, to to update the combined authority on on the extent to which the, the schemes in the Mayor's Challenge Fund do cater for both. 
and I think it is obviously a, a good guiding principle uh, going forward. I'm pleased that the Manchester City Council scheme before us today does do that, um, and you know obviously that that should be what we're trying to do uh, at all at all times, uh, cater for 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 both properly rather than just focus on one or the other. So that, Richard, I will uh, follow that up and we'll, we will bring that analysis uh, back. Uh, colleagues, do I have your uh, agreement to these um, uh, to these recommendations for development costs and full uh, funding approval uh, for the Princess Road Mancunian Way Scheme? Great. 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 Thanks, everybody. Uh, let's move on to um, item uh, 17. GMCA local growth deal and Mayor's Challenge Fund uh, scheme approvals. Obviously, this is a related item. Uh, I'm sure the City Mayor of Salford uh, may want to come in. Um, I'm not sure he's going to, to disagree with, um, uh, with the recommendations either. This is obviously to uh, progress in some ways a similar scheme where we are enhancing uh, cycling and, and walking access to Salford Keys, particularly for uh, residents of, of Audsall and I think this is something that um, everybody uh, was long recognised as needed uh, needed uh, to uh, to be done. Uh, we're being requested uh, to grant full approval for the A5063 Trafford Road Salford scheme uh, and release uh, the funding to Salford City Council from the local growth fund. Um, the remaining £9.5 million pounds of that but separately £4.82 million uh, from the Mayor's Cycling and Walking uh, Challenge Fund to ensure uh, delivery of this um, of this particular uh, particular uh, scheme. Um, just to, to pull out one thing, colleagues, from the um, from the paper, paragraph two point two, um, the full business um, case um, was submitted for uh, gateway funding approval in in February two thousand and twenty, and it obviously looked at. Uh, the scheme in the round and just to report back to you that that review um, which included a thorough uh, value for money assessment demonstrated very high uh, value uh, for money uh, which is great uh, great to see so this is a, a, a really a positive scheme that would en enhance the quality of life for residents uh, in this uh, part of, of Salford and, and indeed uh, the, the city region overall um, I don't know whether the city mayor would like to to come in uh, to contribute. Yeah, um, happy to say a few words, Andy. No, um, obviously we really welcome this scheme, and it's really interesting because obviously in this part of the city region we've been doing um, urban density, so we've been delivering a lot of housing units, and as we know from previous consultations on the spatial framework, residents of Greater Manchester have often been calling for investment in infrastructure. And I think this is demonstrative of our commitment to trying to make that happen. Um, colleagues will appreciate this is a key arterial road as well, going into the city centre and also connecting Salford with, with Trafford. But I mean, this scheme is very supported by, by residents and the communities who, who live in this part of the city region. Um, but it's also about encouraging a lot more, as we've already said, active travel. So reconfiguring roads and walkways to encourage more people to cycle and walk. And we all know the health benefits accrued from that, but also thinking strategically about public realm in all of this as well, to try and encourage more people to enjoy the outdoors. And we've seen a lot of that, haven't we, during this pandemic? And obviously this investment is going to hopefully encourage more of that in this part of the city region. So I really welcome this investment and I thank colleagues for, for supporting this in terms of getting it to where it is today with the full business case. But ultimately, I guess what I'm saying is we need to see more of this across the whole of Greater Manchester, linking infrastructure investment with walking and cycling and hopefully leading to behavioural change in terms of people leaving their cars at home and taking to the bikes and using um, our public realm and, and, and the outdoors a lot more. So this is great, but we need a lot more of this across the city region. I'm sure colleagues will agree with me. Um, and where we're doing urban density, we absolutely should be doing this sort of investment into the public realm. So, you know, I welcome this and thank colleagues for the support. Thanks very much, uh, uh, Paul. Yeah, I agree. We should be doing be doing a lot more, but this is this is a, a big uh, big investment in in Salford, uh, almost thirteen no, over thirteen million pounds. So um, 
uh, a very important uh, important scheme. So colleagues, could I uh, take you through the recommendations? Could I ask for your support for those recommendations? Thank you very much. Item 18, Stockport Mayoral Development Corporation uh, delivery plan in the spirit of handing out some good news uh, to, to you all today. Um, more for Stockport. We're always talking about Stockport. Uh, thanks to uh, uh, the dynamic uh, leader of Stockport and all the work she's uh, she's doing. Um, colleagues have had um, uh, updates before about the Stockport uh, Mayoral uh, Development Corporation. Um, it was established uh, in September uh, last year. I chaired a couple of board meetings, but I was really pleased to hand over to um, somebody of the uh, stature and experience of Lord Kerslake, who is, we are now fortunate, is chairing the Stockport Mayoral Development Corporation Board. As you'll know, um, the plan is to deliver uh, three and a half thousand homes uh, in the area called Town Centre West under the, um, uh, the the arches, the railway uh, arches uh, and the area surrounding it. Uh, age friendly homes, uh, zero carbon. Um, obviously, this involves the uh, substantial uh, redevelopment of uh, Stockport uh, bus station into Stockport interchange with the addition of uh, green uh, green space. Um, it would be fantastic for Stockport without a doubt and and actually as the first mayoral Deve development corporation in the country uh, on a town centre I think potentially could establish a blueprint for brownfield development as the as the paper as the paper says um, and I would said before but uh, say again more than willing to to take this model to any other uh, of the boroughs the nine boroughs that would like to um, take the same approach to place making and, and transforming some of our towns uh, across greater manchester so i i'm so encouraged by the progress this of course is a uh, a delivery plan that's being laid out before you uh 2020 to 25 i think you're entitled to have a high degree of confidence in it given that it has lord kerr's lakes uh, uh, stamp uh, on it. Um, it intends to um, create the newest, greenest and coolest neighbourhood in Greater Manchester. I'll leave you to debate amongst yourselves whether you'll allow Stockport to, to claim that. Um, but it is obviously incredibly uh, important in the current context, going back to what Elise was saying before around the economy, having clear plans coming out of, uh, of COVID. Uh, I think Stockport is right up there, ready to go. Uh, and by approving this today, I think we'll we'll put it in a very strong position um, to to benefit uh, from inward investment. So, again, I'll invite Elise if she wants to uh, to say something. Thumbs up. Uh, over to you, Elise. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Yeah, I you know how enthusiastic I am about this piece of work, and and I think we need to start by putting on record that. One of the things that makes me so excited about the Mayoral Development Corporation is the fact that this actually isn't just about Stockport. The Mayoral Development Corporation is a, is a team effort. It has been uh, achieved because of Stockport and yes, you know, our Labour led council, but it is also um, the work that you, met, Mr Mayor, put into it, the work of this combined authority and the support of the leaders across Greater Manchester. It's the working with government and Homes England and it is this collaborative approach to what we're doing that really sets it apart um, and allows us to really focus something that's actually going to deliver urban regeneration in our town centre and as you said it's a, it is a blueprint it is unique in what it is like much of what we do in Greater Manchester we are setting the standard we're setting the bar um, and I uh, uh, and I think you know that really we really need to say something about that because um, this is this is unique it is the first of its kind and it is something that has the potential to really deliver in other areas too um, what we've seen um, recently um, this that is before you is the strategic plan going forward but this we've not been waiting in Stockport for this plan to be done or or waiting for something else to happen we have been moving forward um, at, at, at pace to deliver on this um, and to show you um, how much we appreciate the uh, this this collective work that we're doing together um, so recently we have uh, completed on a um, 
uh, on a some so on a on an old mill that we have that's kind of tucked underneath our famous viaduct arches, um, and we're looking forward to Capital and Centric bringing forward um, some plans to regenerate and renovate this beautiful old mill that has been in need of some TLC for an awfully long time. We have also um, recently um, agreed. To, terms with BASF who are moving into a brand new office space just outside our uh, train station um, in this beautiful building with superb views across across Stockport um, and we're continuing a lot of work um, that um, uh, Councillor Warrington um, has been um, really supportive of around um, our All Age Living uh, Academy and campus um, near our college, all of which is being helped and supported and facilitated by this delivery vehicle. So I think for me, what I'd like to say is this this strategic plan is is ambitious. We are we are going to be, and I will take anybody on who disagrees. The newest, coolest, greenest uh, urban neighbourhood um, that really puts people, culture, and actually making Stockport Town Centre a place people want to be. Um, and honestly, the invitations out there to any of you who want to come um, and see this work, it would be a pleasure um, to show you round and show you what we're doing. Um, but yes, um, thank you, Mr. Mayor, for the opportunity to speak on this item. Thanks, Elise. I'm probably having opened up that debate about who's the newest, coolest and greenest. I'm probably better back out of it because that's a sure vote loser if I if I tread uh, too far into that. I know Councillor Brett has, has, uh, has, has joined us now. I, I think there were some IT problems, but certainly Rochdale, I've got a shout to uh, uh, the, the most uh, uh, the most momentum on town centre. <coughs> town centre uh, regeneration, thumbs up from the chief executive there. So it's great to see actually all of our towns really, uh, really moving into this uh, in this direction. But obviously this is um, a, a higher level. And it's worth just saying, by the way, the government are talking about imposed development corporations on local authorities. I think this is a much better way uh, to go where we do it ourselves and we choose uh, how, we, how we do it. And um, that's why I think it's really important that we make a success of this and show that this is a, a better way. You, you don't impose uh, uh, devolution, you do it from the bottom up and this is what this is all about. So colleagues, you've got two plans in front of you, a strategic business plan and an action plan. Uh, arising out of it and we're seeking your approval for both. Uh, do we have that? I'll take that as a yes. Thank you very much uh, everybody. Moving on to item 20. Um, this is um, a proposal for a loan to uh, private white uh, VC. Um, I'm going to invite uh, Councillor David Molyneux to uh, introduce the report. Uh, thank you Andy. Uh, obviously, you've got, you've got the report in front of you and I uh, totally endorse the report. I think it goes to show that when we invest public money, how seriously we take it. And you can see from the report that uh, Private White VC, which is a long established company in Salford, uh, have certainly stood up uh, and, and were to be counted in terms of the two contracts, contracts they've now won with the National Health Service uh, to provide PPE. And, I think we all know as leaders the battle that's taking place uh, to get PPE into the right places during this uh, situation that we've found ourselves in. And it's certainly a, a good example of our investment into local companies to provide local jobs and continuously to provide local investment that more and more needed. Uh, they're a good company, they've signed up to the good uh, employment charter uh, and I think we should fully support this and I think it's another fine example of what we do as a combined authority in supporting businesses across GM. Pleasure to move it, Mr. Mayor. Thanks so much, uh, David, and thank you for doing so. I think this is excellent. Um, it puts in into practice what we've been saying, that we should commission more from our own provider base and, and develop a, a PPE supply line in, in uh, Greater Manchester. Um, Colleagues in the growth company, uh, Steve Rumble and others have been doing a great job bringing in PPE from all four corners of the, the globe. But actually, let's in this year of living with COVID, let's get better at bringing it in from our own uh, our own supplier base. And this is a great example of doing uh, precisely that. And actually, again, uh, to hear that they're signed up to the Good Employment Charter, I think it's it's ticking all the boxes of the way we want to go 
coming back from this. So, David, thank you uh, for, for that and the speed that you've moved to uh, uh, put this in place. Obviously, I think it would allow them to become a supplier of uh, gowns uh, to the NHS, which happen in, in short uh, supply. And as Sir Richard said earlier, we just don't know how long we're going to be living with this, do we? And um, the quicker we can get on and support our own companies to, to, to supply, the better. Colleagues, there is a Part B report uh, on this, as there was actually for Stockport Mayoral Development Corporation. I'm taking it that, as with Stockport, colleagues don't want to raise any items in Part B. If not, uh, I'm going to ask for your approval uh, for um, the funding application and the delegation of authority as set out in the report. Uh, colleagues, is that agreed? Agreed. Thank you. Uh, and that brings us to the end uh, of this um, meeting of the Greater Manchester Combined Authority. Uh, just about got there, a few challenges on technology uh, again, everybody, but we, we, we did it. Um, some really powerful reports and contributions from colleagues today on a whole set of serious issues. I, I can see Councillor Brett uh, waving at me. Um, I, I'll take that, he wants to jump in. Uh, Councillor Brett. Well, as I haven't spoken today because of there, because I could follow the meeting, but not only as a guest, so that's why. So I've heard all the, the speeches, etc. Uh, I think I might have missed if Paul Dennett was speaking, but uh, apart from that, could I just say, Andy, have you looked at the Premier League table today just to see where Burnley are and Everton are? And I'll leave you with that thought and wish the best to the leader of Wigan for the weekend. <laughs> well, I have to say the, the Premier League table hasn't escaped me and I was going to have a, I was tempted to have a minute silence for the uh, state of English football this morning, given what happened last night. Uh, oh. I thought I've had your support there, but I decided against it. And uh, I did tell you at Christmas that Burnley would be fine and you were telling me that you, you weren't sure, but uh, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll take that one. Um, and in your absence, uh, Councillor Brett, you were appointed as my deputy on substitute on transport for the north. So uh, I, I hope that, yes, that role. I, can I say I, I watched it all and I heard I heard my name mentioned. So yes, thank you. And I must pay tribute to our IT who worked tirelessly to, to get me online and uh, Microsoft to passwords and everything. Crazy world we live in. <laughs> It's been a challenge, uh, as was Wednesday. So we are going to have a review of IT and just check we've got it all in working order. But uh, thank you for your contribution and best wishes to Wigan. Uh, we'd all echo that uh, for the weekend. So colleagues, that brings us to the end. Uh, thanks for your uh, attention and your attendance. Some good uh, business done uh, this morning. Uh, I will uh, now formally uh, close this meeting and see you all soon. Thank Andy, you. Andy, Andy, Andy. Andy. We have the Agma agenda to do. Sorry, uh, sorry, Julie. We have the Agma agenda to now go into. I thought we had to go out and come back in, but we don't, do we? Yeah. But, uh, my my mistake. Uh, getting ahead of myself there. So, colleagues, we do have an Agma meeting, and I'm going to hand over the chair for this uh, AGM meeting, uh, annual meeting of Agma, uh, to our GMCA monitoring. Officer Liz Treacy. Liz. Thank you. If I could just open the annual meeting of the um, of ACMA for this year and could I ask, <coughs> excuse me, could I ask for nominations um, and a seconder for the chair of the meeting and of ACMA? Can I nominate uh, Andy Burnham? Can I second? Thank you. Really get that, Mr. Burnham, from me. <laughs> <laughs> I shall hand back to the mayor. Thank you. Thank you, colleagues. What 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 an honour. So, uh, <laughs> moving on with the uh, with the meeting, um, we have to uh, appoint vice chairs, uh, and so we need to agree the appointment of Councillor Sir Richard Lees, Councillor David Greenhouch, and Councillor Brenda Warrington as vice chairs of Agma, according to the constitution. Is that agreed, colleagues? Agreed. agreed. Item four: appointments and nominations. Uh, Liz's report. Uh, sets all of these uh, out. I don't intend to read uh, them all. Uh, some are to note, some are to approve. Um, Could I just add um, a couple Liz. of additions that we had, um, please, just in relation to the Health Scrutiny Committee 
Um, if we could add Councillor Showab Akhtar from Oldham and the Statutory Functions Committee, um, Councillor Kate Butler from Stockport as member and Councillor Tom McGee as substitute. Thank you. Are those uh, nominations ag agreed, colleagues, as well as the other re recommendations set out? Agreed. Agreed. Thank, thank you. Item five, declarations of interest. You know what to do. Item six, this is a more substantive uh, item um, and actually significantly strengthens um, our governance and scrutiny arrangements with regard to police and fire. Uh, we've been calling for some time since the um, uh, uh, the fire committee was disbanded that there should be a, an expanded role for the police and crime panel um, and this uh, takes that forward. So Liz, would, would you uh, say a little more? Uh, yeah, um, uh, just very briefly, really. I mean, members will remember the um, agreeing the principles of this some considerable time ago. It's just taken uh, a while to get the order um, approved. It was finally approved yesterday. Um, so I think when the report was done, we were still waiting for it to go through the process. Um, so the order has now been made. The mayors um, can now formally delegate fire and rescue functions to the deputy mayor for policing and crime. Um, and as the mayor has said, um, in particular, functions are now given to the Police and Crime Panel, which will be called the Police, Crime and Fire Panel, to have oversight of fire and rescue functions. And therefore, attached to the report are the amended panel arrangements to include um, the facility for that to happen. Thanks, uh, Liz. Uh, Councillor Brett. You're on mute, Alan. Yeah, okay. only yesterday, Liz. Well, all right, we've been asking. Can I then ask from the follow on? Because, as you know, one of my back benches and, in fact, my chief whip uh, was very involved. Will this now mean that uh, GMCA will have an input into the LGA structure on fire, etc? Will all the functions that used to happen? before the abolished date, you know, before the abolished date, will that go ahead and will there be any appointments made? Because uh, having heard this today and he'll know, he'll want to know uh, what is the going on from this in the wider fire world. I mean, if, if I could just add uh, briefly, it, this doesn't change anything in relation to the fire functions. They they have rested with the mayor since um, since the mayor was elected. Um, the only change in relation to that is that the mayor can now formally delegate some of those functions to the deputy mayor for policing. So it doesn't change anything in relation to that. It simply changes that aspect and the ability of the police and crime panel to have oversight of fire and rescue. So in effect, Alan, it's, a, it's an expanded remit for the committee to, to scrutinise um, Greater Manchester Fire and Rescue Service. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean that the panel at this point changes or expands in terms of its membership. I think, Liz, if I've got that, uh, got that right. Well, the, the, the police and crime, there will be a slight amendment to the police and crime panel just in terms of um, numbers, um, but there will be further appointments from local authorities. Um, it doesn't reference anything to do with appointments by the CA to other bodies, which is the LGA. And presumably we'll bring back uh, the arrangements to appoint those additional members to... It's for the panel this. themselves to appoint, but the, there obviously will be discussions with the local authorities about how that happens. OK, uh, that, that's I think the issue I was talking about, right. OK, I'm, I'm happy to leave it at that, and I'm sure we'll get a briefing on it later. Thanks. Thanks, Alan. So colleagues, um, this is obviously to agree the amended panel arrangements uh, set out at Appendix 1 and uh, to refer those amended arrangements to individual uh, councils for approval. Is that agreed? Agreed. agreed. Thank you very much. Item 7, Revenue Outturn Report. Uh, Councillor Molyneux. Uh, thanks, Andy. Uh, Obviously, there's been a lot of financial discussions over the last week or so. Uh, 
You can see the report before you. This, I'm recommending that you note the report at this stage and then there'll be a further report to the next admin meeting. OK, colleagues, this is just to, to, to note uh, in the interest of transparency. I don't know if Steve wants to say anything or anyone else. No, it's fairly routine. Colleagues, can I ask that that's noted? Thank you, everyone. This time I can uh, bring things to a close. Uh, thanks for your, your attendance, everybody. Uh, have a good weekend and uh, we'll, we'll see you. We'll see you soon. Thank you. Hi. Bye. Bye everyone. Bye.